Special thanks to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast, working tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics mission at horizontherapeutics.com. Obviously, we didn't want a procedure done on our kid when he was just weeks old. And so we were in denial that something was wrong with him. So we continued the NG tube for about six months, I think, during which he did lose weight. We pushed him hard and tried to make him learn to you know, swallow and drink by mouth. Never happened. We failed catastrophically with it. And the moment we got the G tube, life changed. Like his vomitings changed, his quality of life improved astronomically, right? He gained weight. He was way more happier. He could speak because honestly, the, the, the tube down his throat was irritating his throat. It just changed the quality of life, day, like night and day. That's our guest this week, Sanath Kumar Ranesh, the father of a son with an extremely rare disease and co-founder of the Open Treatments Foundation, helping families with rare diseases. We'll hear Sanath's story and how he's working to help families with members who have these rare diseases. That's all on this week's Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. Say hello now to host David Hirsch. Hi, and thanks for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast, Fathers Mentoring Fathers of Children with Special Needs, presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we'd be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. Now let's listen to this conversation between Sanath Kumar Ranesh and David Hirsch. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Sanath Kumar Ranesh of San Jose, California, the father of a son with a super rare disease, a successful tech executive and co-founder of the Open Treatments Foundation. Sanath, thank you for taking the time to do an interview for the Special Fathers Network. I really appreciate you having me here. Um, it's incredible. You and your wife, Ramya, have been married for seven years and are the proud parents of Ragfa, who is three and was diagnosed with SSMD or segregate Asian spinodiometaphyseal dysplasia, an extremely rare progressive disease. Let's start with some background. Where did you grow up? Tell me something about your family. I grew up in Chennai in India. Uh, so it's a southern, it's, it's one of the southern states. And Chennai is, I think, one of the more populated cities in the southern part of India. I definitely grew up in a very, very urban uh, neighborhood. So if you think about India, you, you don't think about, you know, grasslands and, and rural areas. Like I grew up in, in just a farm of buildings, right? <laughs> That's my background. Okay. When you were growing up, did you have siblings? No, I didn't. So you're an only child? I am an only child and pampered. Okay. <laughs> And uh, out of curiosity, what did your dad do for a living? Um, he worked as a regional sales manager. He's probably going to be uh, unhappy because I probably didn't tell him the title right, but he worked as a sales manager at a, a company called BASF. He's retired now. And in a prior conversation, I think I mentioned to you that there's a little uh, family connection to BASF, uh, but it's not worth going into. But a very well-respected German outfit. Um, obviously doing business all over the world, including there in India. So I'm sort of curious to know, how would you characterize your relationship with your dad? It's very interesting um, because, you know, we've been, we've been pretty close. At the same time, we've not been as close, I would say. He, he claims himself to be my friend, philosopher, and guide, uh, and I agree with that. Okay. So were there some important takeaways from your relationship, something perhaps that you've tried to incorporate into your own parenting? Not specifically into my parenting, but I, I was, I've come to realize that I have a thing for reading books, books of a very specific kind uh, that I have just picked up from my father. It's, it's business books because he used to read them a lot as I grew up and I would just like, you know, peek into those books and like ask him questions in the books and stuff like that. Uh, and, and that interest has carried over a lot to me. It's helped me quite a bit. 
through my professional journey and my non-professional journey as well. Uh, so I'd say that that probably had the biggest influence among everything. So his interest in business and then reading about business is what I heard you say. And I'm wondering if there's any other characteristics about your dad that you've tried to emulate. He's, he's generally pretty positive about things. It's also a lot to do with my mom. She's way more positive than my dad. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that is something that has helped me in, in certain tricky situations where you just don't want to look at the negative side of things. Like you just want to be completely oblivious of all the wrong things that could happen because otherwise you're just over, overcome with fear and, and emotions that can never make your progress. Yeah, well, it's an important characteristic. Not everybody um, sees the world that way. You know, some people use the cliche uh, glass half full versus half empty, right? It's the same glass, right? You know, and there's different ways of looking at different circumstances. So I think that's an important characteristic. Thanks for sharing. So I'm sort of curious to know if there is any influence that uh, either of your grandfathers, either on your dad or your mom's side, have had on you. I, I think the biggest influence that my father's side grandfather has had um, is how curious he is about things. You know, this this one little anecdote just kind of summarizes everything. One of our relatives or cousins went to Japan for some assignment and he came back. Uh, my grandfather obviously is super curious and he's sitting with him and talking to him about everything about Japan and trying to learn from him about Japan, right? And then he, he asked this question, well, are there cows in Japan? <laughs> and my cousin's answer was, well, uh, sure, maybe, right? And the next question was, are these cows black, brown, spotted? Like, how do they look? <laughs> and then he goes on to ask, well, does it rain in Japan? Is the rainwater still coming from up above? <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought of myself, I remember the situation because we were just laughing hysterically listening to this conversation. But looking back, you know, he would have made a good scientist because of his, of his naivety at, at looking at everything from scratch and re-examining. Re Although it's pretty annoying to answer his questions sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, those are pretty funny. Well, thanks for sharing. So obviously that curiosity um, is an important characteristic that I think you made reference to. And I'm wondering, um, you talked about your dad's dad, who I remember lived to age 92 and passed away a couple years ago. Did your mom's dad, your maternal grandfather, have any influence as well? Um, yeah, he did. Uh, but he, he passed away when I was too little to have a strong impression. Uh, but my recollection and, and my memories of him have been that of someone who just doesn't care. Um, like he's just carefree, even in the most serious of the situations, which obviously used to drive my, my mom's mom super crazy. Um, <laughs> but then like his anecdotes and situations, I mean, if I were to take a takeaway, obviously don't act like him the way he did, because sometimes it gets too serious and you can't be that, that, jovial in those situations but you know just having a little bit of carelessness here and there helps lighten the mood up and you know keep things under control yeah well thanks for sharing another important characteristic to have about life as well so you're a young guy only child growing up in india in an urban area and i'm wondering what was it that uh, took you to the u.s and has allowed you to pursue the career that you have so after I finished my undergraduation in India, um, I wanted to learn more specifically in you know computer architecture, which is you know how you make computer chips go faster and do all the things that they do. So I decided to apply for my master's here in the U.S. I had the option to go to you know UC San Diego or to Georgia Tech in Atlanta, and I chose the one with the beach, <laughs> obviously, right? Um, and so that's how I ended up in the U.S. Spent maybe I would say six months in computer architecture and then got really fascinated by biotech and bioinformatics back then. And so I decided I'm going to change my career to bioinformatics. Um, and so I cold emailed a bunch of researchers that were working in UC San Diego and I said, you know, here's my, my thesis is going to be in bioinformatics, right? I, I did a little bit, uh, a small stint there in one of the bioinformatics lab, but Turns out I hate it, uh, <laughs> and I decided to go back to you know computers and started working at Microsoft after I graduated. So that was my very small stint in in biotech and bioinformatics, and it came down a full circle after my son was born. So you were at Microsoft for how long? For about a year and a half, and after that, I decided 
you know, I have to be, I have to do the, the thing that, you know, every software engineer in the world dreams to do is to move to the Silicon Valley and work at startups. And so I, I did that for about three and a half years, I think. And then I moved back to Seattle, started working at Amazon and um, moved back to Silicon Valley for a completely different reason, but still working with Amazon. Got it. Thank you for sharing. So I'm sort of curious to know, um, how did you and Ramya meet? We've known each other since middle school. Uh, we went to school together. So we've known for a long time, but then we actually started dating after during college. And uh, did you get married in India or in the States then? Uh, in India. I mean, she moved to the States a year after I moved here. And then we obviously got married in India and then came back here, lived here through for the last nine years. Okay. Well, uh, the reason I am sort of curious is that uh, I have a number of uh, Indian friends and uh, many of them have been involved with arranged marriages. And I'm wondering if that's something that uh, influenced your relationship at all. No, no, this was opposite of that. We were just thankful that our, our families didn't, uh, you know, disown us <laughs> <laughs> because we were of, uh, you know, different subcategories of some religious hierarchical system but I, I don't I don't care about any of those anymore back then we were super scared but you know our families took it in stride and they were totally fine with it and supportive of us getting together but it was, it was far from arranged marriage well thanks for sharing I appreciate your uh, transparency so let's talk about special needs first on a personal level and then beyond so I'm sort of curious to know before Raghav's uh, diagnosis, if you and Ramya had any exposure to the world of special needs. No, no idea. In fact, even after Raghav was born, we were in denial for a really long period. Um, I would say very close to his diagnosis, up until close to his diagnosis. You know, every single decision we had made for Raghav was under the assumption that we could fix what was broken. Um, and, you know, just hearing me speak, these words make me feel very uncomfortable because that is not how you think about special needs. But no one taught us that, right? Uh, we were always taught that, you know, kids are all born perfect and they're all born equal. You know, you have a kid, you take your paternity leave, just have fun with the kid and go back to work and they go, go to school, they grow up, get married, do whatever they want. And that is the only kind of life that I knew about. And so for about, a, for about a one whole year, we were in denial that there was something different or wrong with Raghav. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, owning that uh, issue, the denial issue. It's something that um, most parents face some of, and you, you can only look back on it, right? You don't know at the time that you're in denial, right? You can only look back and connect the dots. And for some, it's a short period of time, and for others, it's a lengthier period of time. And you know, anything we can do, as more seasoned dads to help those younger dads close to the beginning of their journey get over that hump, that denial hump. I think uh, it's going to save a lot of time and hopefully just uh, allows you to address the issue in a more forthcoming way so that you can get the resources that your child's deserving of so that they can reach their full potential, exactly. right? Because weeks, months, years squandered in denial are, you know, just really important developmental periods of time in a child's life. Exactly. And I mean, there's, there's a very specific incident, right? And even, even to this day, we look back at that incident and think, God, think, you know, how, how crazy we were. Um, my son had a NG tube, a tube that goes through his nose for feeding because he couldn't swallow anything by mouth. Our doctors were pushing us to get a G tube from day one, like literally from day one, because they realized, well, this kid is having something that is more serious than uh, most typical kids they've seen, right? And a G tube, a, G a tube directly feeds to the stomach is a lot more safer. It's a lot more comfortable. It'll help him grow. Obviously, we didn't want a procedure done on our kid when he was just weeks old. And so we were in denial that, you know, something is wrong with him. So we continued the NG tube for about six months, I think, um, during which he did lose weight. We pushed him hard and made sure or tried to make him um, learn to, you know, swallow and learn to eat, drink by mouth. Never happened. We failed catastrophically with it. And the moment we got the G-tube, life changed. 
like his vomitings changed, his quality of life improved astronomically, right? He gained weight. He was way more happier. He could speak because honestly, the, the, the tube down his throat was irritating his throat. It just changed the quality of life um, day, like night and day. And I'd rather have done that decision if we had known that something could be off with him, right? And quite honestly, it's a, it's a lot to do with a, a lack of general awareness around special needs, right? And, and a lack of general awareness that kids will be born with different abilities. Some of them might be, you know, different mental abilities. Some of them might be different physical abilities, right? All of them are the same. Uh, it doesn't matter. You, you give them the right support you need to, to have them thrive in, in whatever way they can. Um, what it is not wrong. To give them the support and and we fundamentally believe it was wrong to give my son the support he needed to grow <laughs> it just sounds nuts yeah well thank you again for your authenticity and your transparency i'm hoping that uh, those listening to our conversation will take something away from that especially the super young parents right who like i said are close to the beginning of their journey to be more accepting of the advice that doesn't mean you don't get a second or third opinion right? Um, that's natural, right? Just to be double sure, triple sure of the advice that you're getting. But uh, you don't need to make it more difficult than it already is, right? I guess that's one of the ways I think about it. So what is Raghav's diagnosis and how did the diagnosis come about? So this was on his first birthday. As we were getting ready to cut the cake, I got a call from Raghav's doctor. She said, you know, we found out what was bothering this little guy all along. He has a mutation in a gene called GPX4. But she also said, you know, unfortunately, all the kids with this condition passed away just a few weeks after birth. And so she thought at that point, Raga was the only kid with this disease in the world um, that, that, that doctors ever knew of. What was throwing us off was the fact that there is just no medication for this condition, right? We always assumed doctors have an answer to anything that is quote unquote wrong with humans. Mm -hmm. And turns out there is a vast majority of diseases that doctors have no answers to. And the number of answers they have are, are very, very, very small. I didn't know all of this back then, but I was desperately searching for an answer and the doctors couldn't give us one uh, and they couldn't even give us hope because uh, they said the other kids with this condition passed away a few weeks after birth. And, you know, we have our son, he's one year old, but at that point we didn't know how long he would uh, continue to live. Wow. That sounds like a very heavy level of information to get and in particular, on the day of his birthday, the day they're celebrating his first birthday. I can't even imagine, honestly. Um, so what are the symptoms? What are the different challenges that uh, somebody with GPX4 mutation encounters? Um, the symptoms vary quite a bit, but the common ones are a particular type of skeletal dysplasia. And this is just an abnormality in the way your bone grows, and specifically in the ends of your bone. These kids have what's called cerebellar atrophy, which is your cerebellum not growing as normally uh, and, and big as it should. They have a whole bunch of related issues like hypotonia, which is super low muscle tone. Um, so Raghav cannot even hold his head up on his own. He needs support. He cannot lift his hand on his own. They have you know coordination challenges. Uh, they don't have the ability to eat anything by mouth also although some kids do sort of in the stay in the borderline where they can take enough to sustain they have you know gastrointestinal diseases right like um free acid reflux and a whole bunch of other complications coming out of it they have auditory problems hearing issues vision issues and the list keeps going <laughs> it's a lot wow it sounds like a, it's like a menu, right, of things that uh, you don't get to pick and choose from, but exists. And uh, I'm wondering, when you learned about the diagnosis, it was only a couple of years ago now, um, what were some of the fears that you faced as parents raising a child with these challenges? Um, honestly, we didn't face any fears back then. Hmm. 
we had no clue what we were getting into, right? So we were, you know, this is this is the good part about being a beginner <laughs> is you don't you don't really know how deep the, the the ocean is, right? And you stick your leg into the ocean and hope you land on something solid. And uh, that's pretty much what we did. So when we got the diagnosis, we said the first thing for us to do is to find better treatments because there's none. And so we launched into execution mode, started a foundation, raised some money, got a group of researchers together, that did some work to understand more about the disease, the biology, identified a few drugs that we could potentially repurpose, worked with the FDA to get an approval for an experimental medication, got my stunt started on it through all of this process. We did a lot more scientific experiments that we're continuing to do to find more treatments for him. Um, along the way, we started working on what's called gene therapy that led down to this path of starting a completely different nonprofit organization, the Open Treatments Foundation. But all of this, again, started right after the diagnosis because we had one mission, which is to find a treatment that improves his quality of life. But I will say that we have come to realize that a treatment is not the only way to improve his quality of life. And there are a lot of other factors that go into it, which is what tends to be our big focus these days. Well, we're going to dig into that in a moment, but I want to go back. Was there some meaningful advice that you got early on that put you on this path? Because this is not a typical path for parents to be on. And I hope that came out as a compliment, right? That's what it was meant to be. <laughs> yeah, no, it did. Um, I don't. I don't think there was any meaningful advice. I think. It, I mean, if if there was any meaningful advice, it would have stopped me from going to this path because it is it is the wrong path to go into. Right. It's a lot of desperation, coupled with my. Yeah, it's it's largely desperation driven, right? Like we wanted to do something about him, and coupling that with our interest in solving problems because this is one of the most challenging problems we could ever solve. At that point in, in my life, I personally was just very interested and fascinated in different types of problems that, that we could solve. And I, I, I thought I'd seen and learned um, a lot of different problem patterns um, that we could solve. And a lot of them were solvable with software back then. And this was a brand new problem. And it's a very complicated problem to solve. So I was very excited about doing something about it and trying to solve them. The biggest piece of advice I had gotten back then was not from a person directly, but from a video that I had seen. This was Dr. Matt Might. He had a kid that passed away, unfortunately, that had a rare dis genetic disease. What he did as a computer scientist uh, to find a treatment for him was just fascinating. I think there was a New York Times article on it and, and a video that accompanied that. I remember seeing this video a long time ago. And so I just started searching for uh, this video again, and I stumbled upon his blog post that walks through an algorithm for, you know, finding a treatment for these diseases that don't have a treatment. And so that became my guidebook on the first few steps that I should be doing. And I was just following that to the letter to help me get started. So is he a computer scientist or a doctor, did you say? He is a computer scientist by training. Um, he was a professor in the University of Utah, and he's now leading uh, the, the precision medicine division at University of Alabama, Burning. I'm going to have to learn more about that. That sounds like a fascinating influence on your journey. Were there some important decisions you made as parents on Raghav's behalf that uh, you think have helped the quality of life that you were referring to? Oh, yeah. Many important decisions. The first one was making sure he got a G-tube. The second one, and one of the hardest decisions to make was to decide to pull all of his teeth out because he had a involuntary mouth movement pattern that he just couldn't control that was hurting his tongue and his lips. We initially thought these were blisters that showed up on his tongue uh, and his li lips and we thought it was uh, some kind of infection or something. And as we were sort of like trying to find reason for this problem, we noticed that it started getting worse and it started getting worse as his teeth started erupting. Hmm. It got worse to a point where in the middle of the night, like when he's sleeping, he, he would suddenly stretch his arms and legs out as though he'd gotten an electric shock. Like you could see him in, in pain and distress and he just wouldn't be able to express that simply because his tongue 
moved on the teeth and that was hurting him. It was terrible. We fought hard to keep his teeth, um, but then at the end of the day, we saw everything that we did to keep his teeth and realized this is not scalable, this is not going to help him, and we decided to pull his teeth. And we decided to pull all of his teeth off or so he doesn't have any teeth now, all of his baby teeth, obviously. Hopefully, he will learn to control his, his mouth by the time his, his adult teeth come up. We'll see. But it was one of the hard decisions we had to make. And there are many such decisions that are pretty hard, but then substantially changed his quality of life. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. In addition to the G-tube and pulling the teeth, were there any other decisions that come to mind as it relates to quality of life? Yeah, so we got him a cochlear implant. That is also an important decision to make because the, the process of implanting, in the process, they would sort of cut the connection between the, the ear and the brain and substitute that connection with the device. And so if he was actually hearing, normally we would make it worse. But if he wasn't hearing, we would make it better. After a series of tests, we realized he wasn't hearing and we got him the cochlear implant and that changed his life like anything, right? Now he can understand words, he can gather meanings of words. His hearing has become his primary input mechanism, which previously his sight was the only pri like strong input mechanism he had. So it was one of the big decisions we made. Another big decision, and I think it was a lot to do with us than to do with him, was to moved from Seattle to the San Jose area. We came here for better weather um, so he can have you know a better quality of life. He can go out and do things and not be stuck in the home for nine months of the year because it's cold and raining. That's definitely helped him quite a bit. Is it really that warm year round in San Jose? Um, I'm thinking you could go to like Southern California. Oh yeah, I, I could have. Uh, so it was. It's not that warm per se, but it's sunny, and that makes a huge difference. And that's Stanford, which is one of the big contributing factors for us to move here than to say LA or San Diego. And the the quality of care at Stanford has been amazing. And even if it's not Stanford, we could find sort of related care at UC San Francisco or UC Santa Cruz, which are not too far from here. And so. I think it's been one of the best decisions we've made. And unbeknownst to us, the government support for regional centers for covering accessible vehicles or therapies is just unbelievable here. And I don't think that level of support exists in Washington State, as far as I could see. Yeah, well, there's different programs. So there's pluses and minuses to both the communities. And I don't claim to be an expert, but the regional centers in California are essential for providing resources and services to a wide range of families uh, with disabilities, special needs included. Anyway, uh, thank you for sharing those thoughts, though, about the G-tube, pulling the teeth, the cochlear implant, the move. Uh, it's not one thing, but a whole variety of things that you've made reference to that, you know, I think have uh, led to, like you said, your focus on the quality of life, not only for your son, but for your overall family. We'll be back with more of the conversation on the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast in just a few moments. But first, this quick message. Please help 21st Century Dads gather research on families raising children with special needs by having them complete the Special Fathers Network Early Intervention Parents Survey. A link to the survey can be found in the show notes. As a token of our appreciation, each person, mom or dad, who completes the survey will receive a great dad coin. Thank you. Now, back to the conversation. Out of curiosity, what impact has Raghav's situation had on your marriage or your extended family for that matter? The first big impact that it had on all of us is the acceptance of the situation or initially a lack of thereof, right? We were in denial. We were grieving of the loss of the imaginary future we thought we would have and the loss of the imaginary future that my parents thought I would have and my wife's parents thought she would have, right? That loss is still something that we are grappling with and we have, we have learned different mechanisms to cope up with it. Uh, but on the plus side, we have learned to appreciate every single day for what it is. Like truly, I've read so many self-help books as I grew up because my dad was a nut. He wanted to read self-help books along with business books. <laughs> uh, 
that talks about you know being the moment right and taking each day for what it is and not taking the day for granted and stuff like that it, it, it theoretically made sense to me but i've n- we've never put those in practice until after this whole journey with ragav right and it definitely has had a lot of impact on the grandparents too they have a different outlook of life and their outlook has changed quite a bit through these years and it's made them accept and appreciate that people are diverse that not everybody will go to stanford and become a doctor or lawyer or whatever right different people live to different abilities and that's completely acceptable in in, in a lot of sense this has shaped everything about us that defines what we are today yeah well thank you for being so open and transparent about that there is something to be said for being present, not dwelling in the past, coulda, woulda, shoulda, oh, grieving the loss of the life you anticipated like you made reference to, and then not getting too far out ahead of yourself, right? And anticipating all the challenges or problems, right? Because all that time that you spend in the past or too far out into the future are robbing you of today, right? Which is the only thing you really have. And um, easy to talk about, much more challenging to implement. So thank you again for the emphasis. So I'm sort of curious to know, prior to the Open Treatments Foundation, were there some supporting organizations that you found for your family or for Raga's benefit that you've relied on? There have been several organizations like the regional center I talked about in the Bay Area in California. There is early intervention programs in, in the Washington state that have supported us. We've relied obviously heavily on the medical system, right, that have supported us so far. I think one of the biggest actors in our life today that is not visible is our insurance systems that has paid out (laughs) a ton of money, right? I don't know how I would pay for any of this if it was not for the insurance system. Because, you know, honestly, we would have made decisions to not pull his teeth simply because it was too expensive and that would be disastrous or not get him a cochlear implant because it was simply too expensive. So I'm I'm just thankful and generally grateful for the rest of the ecosystem that exists and not just one organization in particular because without that support system and the ecosystem and kind of the thoughtful structure that has been put in place, we can't be where we are today. Um, Yes, it is not the best system out there. Like it can be improved and I'm trying to be a part of that improvement. But, you know, I, I think there's there's a lot to be said about having a good system like this. Because I could tell you on the flip side, none of this exists in India. So we, we did evaluate back then when Raghav was born, if we should stay here or go back to India. We had the choice to go to Canada, for example. We thought a lot about the support structure that exists here and we wouldn't get any of that. You could argue maybe Canada has a different or a better or worse healthcare system, but I could definitely tell you going back to India was not an option for us because there was just not even enough therapists or there was not enough insurance um, to cover for everything that we need. And I knew folks that were back in India that had special needs and they would talk about not even having the basic equipment for his feeding. That's like, one on one. That's how he he has to eat every day, right? And I cannot live in uh, a place that doesn't have this sort of a system. Uh, and so I'm very really thankful for all of that. Yeah. Well, you're reminding me about a conversation that I had with one of the other dads in the network, Harsha Rajasima, and uh, he was the one that first enlightened me about the huge difference in resources available in India subcontinent versus here in North America. And uh, it seems like night and day. And he's dedicated a lot of his time and resources to not only educating himself as well as he can, but to try to figure out how to bring the type of resources that we have here in the States to those in India, which is pretty remarkable. Absolutely. What you might have picked up in business jargon as a BHAG. Are you familiar with that acronym? No, I'm not. It stands for Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal, BHAG. (laughs) <laughs> which is a very large and audacious goal. It is. So I'm sort of curious now, uh, what role spirituality has played in your lives? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a long topic and I could probably talk to days about it. My family was pretty spiritual. I grew up being very spiritual, religious. The craziness is, was that I, I thought initially I was like, when I was growing up that I was going to become a, uh, what do you call it? A monk. 
Um, <laughs> I did want to. My, my, my mom pulled me out of it. So that's how spiritual I was growing up. And after I, all of us, all of Raghav's diagnosis and this journey, I am more scientific than spiritual, I'd say. I, I don't know about the word spirituality, so I'm not going to use that word. I'd say I'm, I'm more of a scientist than a, a religious person anymore. So I don't believe in anything anymore. I question them. I try to collect facts as much as I can, and I try to disbelieve the facts and make sure I do understand what really, really matters and what doesn't. So it's funny because I'm now getting back into mindfulness and I am approaching that from more of a, a, a scientific standpoint based on what has been done between science and mindfulness. Um, and as crude as you know, it might be, science is the best tool we've gotten to discern between you know, beliefs and what can be a fact, right? May or may not be a fact, but it is close enough to a fact. And we'll have to go based on that. Because at the end of the day, I we have stepped into a lot of beliefs early on during Raghav's um, first year that where we made a lot of mistakes and we made enormous mistakes because of the beliefs we've had. And since then, we've questioned every single, single belief uh, and it has led us to this path of reinventing it for ourselves. So we don't believe it. We don't have a belief system anymore. Yeah, well, I admire your ability to articulate the journey that you've been on. And what I heard you say, if I can paraphrase, is that there's been an evolution in the way you look at things and the way you think about things, which started out more in a religious setting and has grown to be more in a scientific arena. And that what I can anticipate is that the journey will still continue to evolve. And I don't know that they're mutually exclusive. So maybe we should do a follow-up interview a number of years down the road, not because of this issue, but just because I'd be fascinated to see where the Open Treatments Foundation goes anyway. So let's switch gears and talk about that. It's relatively new. It's been founded just in the last couple of years. And as I understand it, the mission is to enable treatments for all genetic diseases, regardless of rarity or geography, using this, what I understand, just verbally understand, but don't quite understand, an open treatment software platform. So what is an open treatments software platform? Um, there's no direct answer to it because the platform doesn't exist in, in all its glory yet. The mission does exist. So, so here was my problem. The conundrum that I was facing was that Raghav's disease has only 10 patients worldwide. And his disease is so rare that I, I'm willing to bet all my fortune on it that there would be no company today that would be willing to fund a treatment for him. Right. So if you think about it, there's a trillion dollar industry out there that's moving trillions of dollars a year and there's not even a single dollar left to create a treatment for my son. So I started asking the why question. Why is this so? Right. Um, and long story short, I realized if my son or kids in the future born with this disease need to ever get a treatment, the solutions to these problems have to include everybody or have to at least be designed to include everybody, right? Uh, it might not be economically feasible to include everyone today, um, but the design of the system will allow you to include more people down in the future. And so, for example, we launched the Open Treatments Foundation last year with a software platform to decentralize drug development. What we, the idea, the premise was that um, building gene replacement therapies is a simple process but it obviously requires a lot of money and a lot of people involved. So let's get patient-led organizations that are caring about their patient communities to go build a treatment for their diseases they care about. And so that way we can create a, a platform where if any, anyone like me or that's interested in creating a treatment for their disease has all the recipes available to go build a treatment, obviously you got to do the hard work of raising the money, getting the right people involved, but the recipe is available. Right. And we started this platform last year. We got some feedback and made us realize, well, gee, this is not the most fundamental problem to be solved yet. 
because if the diseases do get a treatment and the patient-led organizations try and create a treatment in, in an academic setting, that eventually needs to be handed off to the industry, right? Which comes back to this problem of there's just no economic incentive to create a treatment for 10 people. And so I started looking at the more fundamental problem. And it turns out that a lack of awareness about disease is the problem that's slowing all of us down. And it's way more fundamental than what we think about it. So to be specific, if I were to walk into Stanford and walk to the the dean of Stanford's biomedical research, right, uh, or someone that is supposed to know a lot, they wouldn't know about my son's disease. They wouldn't even be able to find a place to find about my son's disease. That's how rare it is, right? It's crazy because most often you can Google. What do you Google for, right? Um, and so it's that rare of a disease that people don't even have a place to go browse and find new diseases that are up and coming and learn about them and help find and help attract resources to tackle them. So um, what we are switching over to now is building a new platform where we will help raise the awareness of all the diseases. And by design, the platform does not restrict itself to any particular disease. And so if we find a disease that just showed up on the radar three months ago, that is still something that we will be able to show up on on a web page for people to, to read about, understand, and potentially tackle, right? And so the hope is that we can solve problems using software at a global scale that was previously not possible. And we are not promising that all of these diseases will get treatments, but we are at least leveling the playing field and putting every disease on the map. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of a, a high level overview of what we are trying to do. Yeah, well, it sounds very audacious as well. But if I could paraphrase what you've said, you've got to get all these rare diseases on the map before you can start to make headway into finding cures or treatments, if not cures, for these diseases. And it's a long journey, right? Uh, not one that's going to lend itself to immediate solutions. And like you said, there is no or a very low economic incentive, right, for biopharma companies to be investing in these areas where there are not enough uh, patients, right, to justify making large investments. And that's just the harsh reality of, you know, how pharmaceutical companies, you know, do what they do, right? They're not illuminacenary organizations, right? They're in business, right? And they serve a very, very valuable purpose, but they don't serve everybody, right? And what I hear you saying is that what you hope to do through this software platform is to level the playing field so that more people will have access to the resources that do exist. And that by leveraging the uh, platform, more people will get treatments uh, than they would have otherwise. Is that fair? Largely, but with a difference. So it's it's about creating the, the the society for the future, and it's not about reorganizing the current society. If you think about it, so I, there is just no people on Earth today, living today, that's going to help go build the treatments for all of the rare diseases we have. It doesn't exist, right? Uh, these people have to be minted somehow. Right, um, you have to convince a Stanford professor or MIT professor to go work on this disease, and that convincing process has to be organic and potentially something that has to be that they have to stumble upon during their PhD days or maybe their their high school days. You can't really say that for certain, right? The technology that you need to create treatments might not even be available today yet for some of the diseases, right? So there's a lot of things that that need to happen to create a society where treatments are available and a prerequisite to all of them is making sure human beings on the planet either born today or will be born in the future recognize and understand that all of these diseases exist that 400 million patients worldwide are suffering with and they have a responsibility and they also have the tools in their hands to help go build a society where the treatments can be created so it's it's more meta meta than 
creating a platform where, where every disease can get a treatment. It's more of creating a platform that will then create a society where treatments will be created. Okay. Well, you've gone uh, way above my pay grade now, but thank you for trying to explain that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's it's... If you think about it in Lego analogies, right? If you think of the world as a, as a massive Lego, right? Just think of a Lego Lego tie that you built. It looks abstract. It looks dumb. Um, it can maybe you know do one thing, right? It can maybe, it's maybe a car that moves forward. But if I don't, I want to reorganize a Lego and make a, make it into a car that moves sideways. How do I do it? I'm not giving you the recipe, but I'm giving you enough interest so you as a person can change the lego to make it go sideways so it's a little bit more meta than that and that for the outcome is not immediately obvious but the whole idea is to is to reshape is to change the society is to change how people think about this problem yeah well thank you it's very enlightening i'm thinking about advice now and i'm wondering uh what advice would you have to a father or a couple for that matter that finds themselves you know, with a recent diagnosis of a rare disease? Um, the biggest advice I would give them is is find a path to acceptance. I think that's the first step before anything is possible. Find a path out of denial. The sooner you can do that, the better it'll be. And there, this is not a, a one directional activity, right? You'll have acceptance in some areas and not others. You'll go back and regress and you'll you will relearn your acceptance. And the, the way you accept things will change over time. So you have to re-accept the same thing again later, but find your tool or your path to acceptance. That's going to change uh, your life quite a bit. Yeah, well, great advice, very insightful. And uh, one of the aspects of denial is that uh, it's not like you get over that and it's in the rearview mirror and it gets smaller and smaller, right? Because you are going to be grieving that loss periodically and in a way that you can't even imagine, right? Things will trigger uh, these thoughts and whatever you can do to, like you said, find a tool or a series of tools or a path that will help you build the mental discipline to be forward focused as opposed to backward focused and to avoid the getting out too far ahead of yourself like we talked about earlier. So very prescient advice. Um, I'm curious to know why is it that you've agreed to be a mentor father as part of the Special Fathers Network and in light of the fact that you only have a three-year-old? I think my son has taught me everything that I need to know um, about about everything I'd say um, about life in an accelerated way. I, I don't think I, I claim to know everything, but he's at least taught us to ask a lot of questions um, and, and not believe anything that we see of face, face value, which is pretty powerful because it can help you pretty much generate all of the right things that you need in life and, and spot the things that don't work. Um, you're not, you're not going to be perfect, but you can at least get there. So I'm happy to help um, in any way I can. Yeah, well, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, Thank you for being involved. And it's not lost on me that while you're offering to be a mentor father, you have so many milestones ahead of you, right? You and Ramya are just young parents with a three-year-old. And there are other dads in the network that have a decade or decades of experience, right? So I'm hoping that you'll benefit from some insights that they might be able to share with you as well. So Maybe you wear two hats, your mentor hat for those families that are closer to the very beginning of their journey, and then that you'll be in the presence of others who have been there and done that, right? And not just over a short period of time, a couple, three-year period of time, but over a decade or decades. I'm hoping that you'll be a beneficiary as well. Absolutely. So is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? No, I'd just like to thank you for, for having me here. It's it's an amazing resource that you're, you're creating um, and, and, and one that's going to enlighten a lot of people as they go through this journey. And thank you for your f- focus on special needs because that is unique and, and, and difficult and a resource that I hope I, 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 I had when we had a diagnosis. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. So let's give a special shout out to our mutual friend, Effie Parks of the Once Upon a Gene podcast for making the introduction. Effie's awesome. If somebody wants to learn more about the Open Treatments Foundation or to contact you, what's the best way to do that? 
you can go to opentreatments.org. Um, that has uh, that's the web page that has all the information that we are, we're building, um, and you can always reach out to me at uh, sanath s a n a t h at gpx four dot org. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. If you hit me up, I'm always looking at LinkedIn on my phone all the time. So uh, I'm I'm pretty much on all platforms except on not super active on Facebook. We'll be sure to include all that information in the show notes so it makes it as easy as possible for people to follow up with you. Of course. Santa, thank you for taking the time and many insights. As a reminder, Santa is just one of the dads who's part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising a child with special needs. If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a mentor father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concern. Would you please consider making a tax deductible contribution? I would really appreciate your support. Santa, thanks again. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. The Special Fathers Network is a dad-to-dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children match up with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support other dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group, please go to facebook.com groups and search dad to dad. Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, please send an email to david at 21stCenturyDads.org. The Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast was produced by me, Tom Couch. Thanks again to Horizon Therapeutics, who believe that science and compassion must work together to transform lives. That's why they work tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics at horizontherapeutics.com.